Good evening. I call to order the work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for November 19th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Joining us is Bryce Purcell. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, that was wonderful. <laughs> Our first item on the agenda is consideration of the November 19th, 2019 agenda. Dr. Jones, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Board Chair Causey, there are no additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. One, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Our first speaker this evening is Brandon Luzar. Our second speaker is Kara Piles. Our third speaker is Jesse Jager. Our fourth speaker is Diana Bergman. Our fifth speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our sixth speaker is Melissa Rodola. Our seventh speaker is Tia Knott. Our eighth speaker is Heather Atna. And our final speaker is Glenn Gielhar. And they will speak later to us in the public comment portion. Our next order of business is a special order of business, recognition of student artwork. And at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Jones to join me up front for a presentation. Every year, the Board of Education publishes the comprehensive annual financial report, and each year, student artwork is included in the publication. The fiscal year 2019, CAFR, as we lovingly call it, includes the work of elementary school students. Later this evening, the CAFR will be presented to the board, and we would like to recognize those students whose artwork is included. Each participating student receives a gift card to Barnes & Noble Bookstore. The following student's artwork was selected. When I call your name, please join us up front and remain with us because we will take photos at the end. We have Alexa Branch from Randallstown Elementary School. Congratulations. The next student is Tyson Melvin from Lions Mill Elementary School.
Congratulations. The next student is Grace Raleigh from Honeygo Elementary School. She could not be with us tonight, but we appreciate her artwork. And the next student is Erin Sembley from Cedamere Elementary School. Congratulations. The next student is Niara Sherrod from Cromwell Valley Elementary School. Congratulations, sweetie. And she has something for you. The next student is Kieran Vincatisin from West Towson Elementary School. <laughs> Apparently not able to join us this evening. So the, the students were all given a certificate and their gift cards and we're gonna take photos now. So let's give another round of applause to these students. We love when the students come to join us. The next item on the business is new business personnel matters, and for that we call forward Ms. Maria Lowry. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Jones, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there a second? second. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Do I, is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business, administrative appointments, and we now call on Dr. Jones to present the administrative appointments. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, on behalf of Dr. Williams, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Senior Fleet Supervisor in the Office of Transportation and Specialist Board Certified Behavior Analyst in the Office of Special Education. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G1? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, joining us this evening, we have Mr. Michael Groff. Would you please stand? Mr. Grock is our senior fleet supervisor in the Office of Transportation. His background and experience includes a variety of experience as a manager in Vehicle Safety and Compliance Division for School Vehicle Safety Section and Vehicle Emissions Inspection Program with the Maryland Department of Transportation, Vehicle Compliance Agent Supervisor, Vehicle Compliant Agent 1 and 2, and all of those experiences were with the Department of Transportation um, Maryland Department of Transportation. He's a manager or have been a manager in the Country Club Automotive field and a mechanic inspector in Country Club Automotive. Supporting Mr. Groff this evening is his fiance, Kristen McDonald. Would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. We also have with us Hillary Mangi. Would you please stand? Specialist Board Certified Behavior Analyst, Office of Special Education. Background experiences include Behavior Support Specialist in Carroll County Public Schools, ABA Consultant, Clinical Supervisor, Lead ABA Therapist, ABA Therapist, all with the Schaefer Center for Early Intervention. Do you have anyone joining you this evening? 
All right, so we're all here to celebrate you this evening. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. Our next item of business is new business board policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policies. This is the first reading. Policy 3210, purchasing guidelines. Policy 3215, contract execution. Policy 3250, selection of design and construction consultants. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit H. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? No second is needed since there, the recommendation comes from the committee. Do I have a motion? Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, or practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members in hard copy or via email to boe at bcps.org. I will now call on our stakeholder groups to speak. And our first stakeholder for the evening is from the Baltimore County Student Council, Superintendent Student Advisory Council, Ms. Ashley Kane. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Smob Omar, and members of the board. My name is Ashley Kane, and I'm an education liaison with the Baltimore County Student Councils here on behalf of Angela Chin, President of BCSE. Tonight, I would like to talk to you about what we've been doing. BCSC has been working with the county on our climate change and environmental initiatives. We recently had our first meeting of the Youth Climate Council where we worked with government officials like Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski and Delegate Steve Lafferty to work on our initiatives to improve Baltimore County's environmental awareness and environmental activism. Through this initiative, Baltimore County students have been working with powerful youth from across the county, from private to public schools, a truly intersectional effort and diverse con conversation, including student organizers of the Baltimore Climate Strike last September. We have a lot to learn from our peers, including the idea that action begets action. So our action in pursuing sustainability goals will snowball to inspire other members of the community to create change. The push for sustainability might start with us, but it will not end with us. We thank you for your continued support. BCSC has also been working, as always, to improve the lives of all students in Baltimore County. BCSC Executive Board, Environmental Committee, Infrastructure Committee, and General Services Committee have been working to improve school for all students and will continue to do so. As always, feel free to contact myself or Angela with any concerns or information you may have. We hope that you will continue working to ensure the best for all students in Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker for the evening is Teachers Association of Baltimore County, President Cindy Sexton. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Jones, and members of the board. According to 2017-18 data, the teacher shortage crisis, and it is a crisis, is at approximately 110,000 nationwide. 
The U.S. Department of Education reports that overall, roughly 8% of teachers leave the profession each year. BCPS's numbers over the past three years are at or above that mark. It used to be much easier to fill teaching positions, but not so anymore. There is value in being taught by an experienced educator. We need to give our teachers time and support to develop into those experienced educators. Two weeks ago, I spoke about the need for teachers to have more planning time. Our newest teachers and our veterans need time to become experts in the curriculum they are teaching. And that time is planning time. It's one of the items in our negotiations package and I can't stress the importance of it enough. Last week, Tabco ran a social media blitz on Facebook where teachers shared what they would do with more planning time. Hundreds of teachers chimed in and almost all of them talked about how more planning time would help them better serve students. And while a great deal of time and effort goes into attracting new teachers, I urge the policymakers in this room to concentrate their time and resources on developing and retaining high quality teachers. Instead of implementing interventions that yield minimal results in schools and are often costly, attention must be paid to what educators say they actually need to stay in our system and our profession. The repeated requests from teachers about how to support them in their daily work. Well, because the money too. The U.S. Department of Labor conservatively estimates that attrition costs an employer 30% of the leaving employee's salary. If we take the salary scale at its lowest starting salary, $49,472, times 30%, the estimated cost of attrition, times the number of resignations from August 1st through November 5th of this year, that's 154 resignations, the cost to the system is over $2.28 million since August 1st. I know members of this board want to staff BCPS with highly qualified educators. As the voice of educators, I implore you to hear what we are saying. Planning time is key in recruiting us, key in retaining us, and key in helping us to create excellent student outcomes. Let's work together to find more planning time so we don't have to keep work to find replacement teachers every single year. Our kids can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is from the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, um, Ms. Kiria Joseph. Good evening, Board Chair Clausey, Board Vice Chair Hen, and to our amazing West Zone Community Superintendent, Dr. Jones, and board members. The Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, finally known as BCAPSI, will host our kickoff meeting uh, this Thursday, November the 21st at 5 p.m. We are looking for BCPS staff, executive leadership, retired BCPS educators, and parents who are ready to do the work to improve learning for students, especially students of color. BCAPSI is an affiliate of the National Alliance of Black School Educators, NAPSI. At the NAPSI 47th Annual Conference last week, we had the opportunity to engage with over 1,000 educators from around the country. We received training on leadership development. One session by Principal Kafali poised the question, is my school better because I lead it? John F. Kennedy said that efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. I ask everyone this ref reflective question, is BCPS better because you are a part of it? We hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving and a restful time with their family. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is from the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council, Ms. Marlena Purcell. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone and board members and Dr. Jones. Um, my name is Marlena Purcell. I am the chair of the Southwest um, Education Advisory Council. Um, on Monday, November 11th, we met at Whitmore Elementary School, and while there, we had a meeting specifically related to bullying and cyber um, bullying. Um, 
we didn't have the entire geographic area represented. However, um, we did have a healthy discussion and dialogue um, along with the board member, Ms. Mack, um, about bullying and school safety. And it was led by BCPS Dr. Ford um, and his boss. <laughs> but nevertheless, we, I just wanted to bring forth today um, an issue that the board needs to be aware of and perhaps take consideration on. Um, it seems to be a limited or a lack of consistent policies uh, as it relates to certain situations such as threat or immediate timelines. Um, for example, one parent indicated that um, there was an incident in the child's bathroom, um, in the bathroom of the school in which the school did not call the parent on the day it happened. So it happened on a Friday, the parent was not notified on that Friday, therefore the parent found out, came up to the school to talk and had a discussion with the principal on the Monday um, because obviously it was told. The other issue that was brought before us was a parent in regard to um, digital content and social media, um, specifically as it relates to her child had a text message of threat, a threatening text message. The counselor, of course, indicated, you know, how do you feel, are you okay? And the child to save face, as they would say in the schools, um, they really just said, yes, I'm okay. Um, and because of, yes, I'm okay, she went along her day and something did happen. <laughs> and so while it is absolutely true that we can't have a policy that accurately covers and addresses every possible situation, I think it's definitely possible to identify um, the persons in the building who need to be advised and how the first steps should be taken so that these concerns are handled in a more consistently and across the board systematic way. I was really shocked to hear that, and I know Ms. Mack, you can um, fill me with that sentiment exactly. Um, and I think that Dr. Ford, I thank Dr. Ford because he is um, working on that and will get back to me with a resolution. As I close, I'd just like to say that I really um, am very proud to say that we had a working relationship and we continue to work with all of you. And our next meeting is December, the, the second uh, Monday of the month of December. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is from PTA Council of Baltimore County, Andy Higgins. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Uh, hello to so all of the board members and everyone in attendance. Uh, my name is Andy Salim Higgins. I'm the uh, secretary for Newtown High School PTSA. Um, and, uh, well, let me backtrack. So in the summer of this year, uh, the executive board, along with uh, Principal Martin at Newtown High School, met, and one of the reoccurring themes from a lot of the parents in terms of the feedback um, and staff as well was them wanting to become um, better and more effective advocates uh, for the students, for the community at large. And so um, the executive board, we uh, took it upon ourselves to set a goal for ourselves to help facilitate that process, to do a small part to help facilitate uh, that process. So after the first uh, school board meeting of the year, um, I spoke to Dr. Williams and our district rep, Ms. Makita Scott, and invited them uh, to come out to a meeting to address the idea of um, parents being better advocates. And so they told me email, uh, send the contact information. Um, and, you know, a lot of times that's sort of, you know, polite speech for it. Yeah, we're definitely not going to show up, so you can email us and whatever. But uh, Ms. Makita, um, she confirmed the very next day. Uh, Dr. Williams it took a little bit longer, but I'll try not to hold that against him. Um, and uh, he was, uh, unfortunately, he had a scheduling conflict, so he wasn't able to attend. But um, in his stead, uh, he sent um, community superintendent Dr. Jones um, and executive director of school support Dr. Scriven. Uh, so along with them, uh, we also had Mr. Baysmore, Councilman Julian Jones, and of course, um, uh, Ms. Makita Scott in attendance. Um, and we're very thankful for that because um, what proceeded to happen was we had an incredibly engaging conversation um, about um, how to be advocates and how to engage. Um, not only did uh, were they able to speak to sort of the macro and some of the larger issues that as a school board you have to address, um, but they were also able to speak to specific um, things taking place in our schools. Um, and what um, everybody walked away with uh, was 
a sense of being energized because all of the representatives, uh, they were so passionate. Um, and so engaging and thoughtful. Um, and they were able to take complex situations and simplify them and make it real for us. And, and I think that was part of one of the things that we wanted to accomplish in a meeting is not just connecting people to how they can become advocates, um, but understanding that it's a partnership. And so not seeing you all as titles and you know uh, sort of figureheads, but seeing you as people and, and knowing that um, you are very passionate. Uh, the reason that you got into this is because you felt like you could make a difference. And so that was one of the things that was communicated really well. And so I just want to thank, again, Dr. Williams, Ms. Makita Scott, uh, Ms. Jones, uh, Mr. Scriven, who isn't here, um, Councilman Julian Jones, uh, Mr. Bazemore, and that principal, Martin Felton, facilitator. So now is the opportunity for public comment, and our first speaker for the evening is Mr. Brandon Luzar. Good evening and welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Brandon Lazar. I apologize for standing out of turn back there at the beginning. I'm, it's my first time here. Um, I'm a Hampton parent. I'm a parent of two children. I'm very concerned about the boundary study currently being completed. Um, the boundary study, as presented, is using erroneous data and is falsely constrained. Um, the boundary study, as presented, by using only three schools, not including more schools that are within the central zone and then using outdated data is forcing a solution that is going to rely on transportation. The transportation solution is going to bus students to the eighth closest school to their homes. Many of these students currently are closer to seven other, or seven other schools. Um, the schools excluded from the study, um, many of them, Stonely, Cromwell Valley, um, one of the primary guiding principles, well, the two primary guiding principles of this study are capacity utilization and, and increasing or improving diversity. Um, the closest school to many of these homes is among the least diverse in the county. Um, again, another school, Cromwell Valley, which lies about halfway in between these populations and uh, Hampton, is without explanation, again, excluded from the study. Um, it, it's kind of frustrating that the data as presented by using 2018 numbers is grossly under, underestimating the impact on Hampton. The data suggests in the study that Hampton will be at 97% capa capacity. Current data sets suggest that if completed, Hampton will be somewhere between 110 and 115% capacity. Only a few years ago, prior to the renovation, we had trailers at Hampton. Now, we don't know where we're going to be. And it's insulting to feel that we don't know where we're going to be. And it's just frustrating. Um, with current development in the Hampton zone, none of it is included in the study. The study, while recognizing the fact that development is happening, also recognizes that the data is not going to be used based on the development that's happening. On top of that, the development that was recognized is about half of what's actually going to happen. Um, the number of other concerned parents here, um, it's one of our first times being at a BCPS meeting. I thank you for, our time, for your time. Um, I just really hope that we can have more dialogue, search for a more comprehensive solution. Um, I don't think it's just three schools. I think you have to include everything. I think you have to consider transportation. Transportation should be a constraint. Um, again, I thank you for your time. Um, if there's any way that we can help, let us know. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Kara Piles. Good evening and welcome. Hi. I'm just going to read from my phone because I'm a terrible public speaker. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Good evening. I'm here tonight as a homeowner in both the Hampton and Pleasant Plains districts and because I'm gravely concerned about the impact this Pleasant Plains boundary study will have on both communities. Every school named in this study is either already over capacity or will be in the next few years. 
I'm angered and confused that despite this being such an important topic, old outdated, old outdated student numbers were used, completely skewing the study. I'm also frustrated that planned construction projects impacting the Hampton School Zone will have not been taken into consideration. I'm downright terrified at the thought of busing children on interstates in school buses without seatbelts, despite a well-known dire shortage of bus drivers when there are other options that haven't been considered and when there are several other schools that are closer and could help alleviate the problem. I'm here to ask that the existing boundary study as currently presented to us be halted to allow time for a more comprehensive and well thought out, longer lasting plan to be considered. Lastly, as a parent of a dyslexic child in an already overcrowded classroom who learns a little more each day how to hide her dyslexia and learning challenges from her teachers, I'm begging you to consider including additional schools to help alleviate the blatant overcrowding issue in all of these communities. The solution is not to move kids across town in unsafe modes of transportation to schools outside of their neighborhoods, but instead to finally do what's right by our children, build another school, or at the very least update existing schools to allow for more children and educators to thrive and become future leaders of our wonderful communities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Jesse Yeager. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. I'm here tonight because I am disappointed and angered at the lack of foresight at Baltimore County and BCPS. The Pleasant Plains Capacity Relief Study and the recent high school capacity study is clear evidence that BCPS is aware of the serious overcrowding problem. Every school named in the study, if not currently overcrowded, is close enough that it certainly will be within the next few years. This is a county-wide problem. All students, no matter where they live in this county, deserve a good education. A crowded school does not provide a safe or a good education. Using 2018 numbers completely skews this study. In addition to the fact that 2019 numbers are already much higher, new construction is not even being taken into consideration. How and when will decision makers take into account that there are several new construction projects in the area that will bring large numbers of new students to Hampton Elementary as soon as next year? During the recent Delaney Valley Road apartment construction, our principal was told that Hampton could expect about 12 to 15 new students. Hampton actually receives 80 students from that area. I'd like to know exactly why Hampton and Halstead are the only schools considered in this study. Oakley and Harford Hills are much closer. Why bus kids across boundaries on an interstate in buses without seatbelts pass closer schools with space to get to Hampton? Why was an expansion of Cromwell Valley Elementary outside of its magnet program not considered? There are surrounding neighborhoods that Cromwell Valley could take on that would alleviate Pleasant Plains and reduce the need for extra busing again on highways. I also want to know why Lock Raven Elementary cannot be utilized and reinstated as a school. This boundary study is a tiny solution to an enormous problem. Our population will continue to grow. We already know we are facing catastrophic overcrowding in our high schools in the next eight years. If we only focus on three schools to alleviate a countywide problem, we fail to recognize other possibilities for facilitating a solution. It's essentially kicking the can down the road just moving the problem from one area to another. We need more schools. We need to expand, utilize, and facilitate the use of all existing buildings and schools capable of alleviating this overcrowding problem. Stop development until this problem is completely addressed, using current numbers and taking into consideration the vast projected growth and expansion to these areas. Baltimore County is building skyscrapers on sand. Let's work together to build at the bigger picture and solve this problem. You cannot have a good community without good schools, and an overcrowded school is not a good school. I am here to fight with you. Let's do it the right way the first time for our kids, for our neighborhood. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Diana Bergman.
Good evening, everybody. And today I am Mama Bear Bergman. So I figure with my next three minutes, let's talk about how we could help with the shortage that is driving Baltimore County insane, especially when it comes to our special education students. We have some serious concerns regarding our shortage for bus drivers and our special education support one-on-one -on -one staff that tend to help a lot of our students implement those IEPs in the 504 plans. So helpful tips with my three minutes. Let's talk about instruction. We talk about buildings, we talk about buses, but let's bring it back to what's important, educating our children and make sure they have access to their instruction. So mama tip, mama um, bears tip number one is preferential seating. What does that look like for a child? Well, preferential seating looks like for a child based on that individual need. That doesn't mean in front of the classroom, behind the classroom, it's for the child. Make that preferential seating for what that child needs. Extended time. Extended time looks different for each individual child on their IEP or their 504 plan. It could be 10 minutes, 30 minutes, time and a half, or a few days if the child has a processing memory disorder which means they need constant reminders and organizational skills to have extended time to finish the process of turning in the work they did three days ago, because they forgot. Oh, let's see. Oh, sensory, frequent breaks. Frequent breaks looks very different for each individual child with an IEP. Why do we do frequent breaks? Frequent breaks is what we do to help a child get some of that sensory motor skill movement so they could stay focused and have access to instruction. Frequent breaks does not mean that for math time, the child needed two breaks, so he needs two breaks for reading, for writing, for art or music. For each education environment that the child's learning in that subject might require different frequent breaks. And why do we do the frequent breaks? Because if you do your frequent breaks, you don't have children eloping from the immediate area. Do you want that child to get their frequent movement and breaks by having it done in a structured way? Or do you want to chase a child as they elope out of the classroom for 15, 20 minutes? So I know that it's a challenge, but I'll be giving more helpful tips from Mama Bear Bergman moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Dr. Bosch Faron. Good evening and welcome. Good evening to all. Thank you for the welcome, Madam President. Violence in Baltimore County is on the rise. And I think the same thing in BCPS. So some communities like Franklin Middle School, Dundalk School, Lutherville Lab, and others reported more bullying. Some of the communities are intimidated and not reporting or maybe cooperating. I really want to make sure that the board know that such violent acts by students our behavior problem. They are a manifestation of underlying social problem and could be actually more than that. Reporting, I sit in on, the, on this board for so many times, I feel it's un underreported. Our goal, I think, should be really to look at the cause. Why is it happening? There must be a cause if a student bully somebody else or commit an act of violence. Knowing the etiology require more staffing, and it's not really about just numbers game, not about pouring money on the problem, it's about training teachers and staff to recognize bullying and to recognize the underlying reasons behind it. Smaller class is really well known. Bigger classes, will lead to students to have misbehavior, bullying, and otherwise. So what I am calling on is really not to forget for the system to look at home environments. I know your task is really about PCPS, the school system. But these behavior problems with children starts at home. 
and they could have underlying disease. So those needs to be addressed. Our teachers need to be high quality teachers so they recognize the problem and treat it well. And of course, they need to have adequate staffing. So why am I all of a sudden not talking about holidays and talking to you about, <laughs> about something else? Either we address the issue at the school level or we pay the price when they grow up and do mass shootings or killing because of a hamburger or killing because of a girlfriend or any of those silly reasons. I think the school system not only has the ability but has the duty to address these social issues as difficult as they are. And to remember my friend Roger Hayden, it's all about kids and you cannot pour money on the problem. You have to identify the factors and fix them and money comes as an assistant to identifying the etiology of the issue. Thank you. And our next speaker for the evening is Melissa Rodola. Did I say that right? Yes, Rodola. Great. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I, too, am here as a Hampton Elementary School parent. I, too, am disappointed um, with the current pleasant plain capacity of relief study. As you can see, there is an overcrowding problem. Each school mentioned in this study is overcrowded or close to. This countywide problem, all students deserve a good education. A crowded school does not provide for a safe or good education. The current 2018 numbers being used are not accurate. The 2019 numbers are much higher. As stated by other parents, new construction is not being taken into consideration. How and when will a decision be made to take into account the new construction projects that are in the area? This too will bring a large number of new students to Hampton Elementary School as soon as next year. Keep in mind the recent Delaney Valley Road apartment construction. Hampton Elementary School received 80 new students from that area. Why are Hampton and Halstead the only schools considered in this study? Again, as other parents mentioned, busing kids across boundaries on an interstate past closer schools does not seem like a valuable or necessary solution. This boundary study is a tiny solution to an enormous problem. Again, I just want to repeat that. This boundary study is a tiny solution to an enormous problem. We need to think outside of these three schools. In short, as many of us have already said, we need more schools. I look forward to working with Baltimore County Schools and with all of you to solve this growing problem. Let's do right the first time. Let's do right for these children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, and actually I'm going to jump back. I uh, have a, from our stakeholder group, I um, need to call on Mr. Ken Gutman. He's from the Career and Technology Education Advisory Council. So good evening and welcome. Good evening. I'm Ken Gutman. Thankful to be here today to have the opportunity to speak with you. A little background on me. I'm the chair of the Career and Technical Education Advisory Council. I'm a product of BCPS, having gone to Lock Raven Elementary, Middle, and High School. And I have three children currently in BCPS, one at each level. So I'm here again to highlight the CTE programs at BCPS. C CTE provides 21st century career relevant education to our students, making them ready for productive careers or for college. There are currently 30 programs in 10 career cl clusters. The programs provide employability skills, project-based learning, internship opportunities, industry apprenticeship programs, and importantly, maybe most importantly, the opportunity to, to earn industry recognized certifications while in high school. CT continues to form partnerships with local businesses and industry to enable students to receive hands-on training and internships. This is a critical part of CT success, working directly with our community employers. So I have some good news to share and then some needs. Good news, a formal partnership with Toolcoff Food Products in Patapsco High School 
has been formed for our apprenticeship Maryland program. Toolcoff is the first BCPS business partner to be approved by the Maryland Apprenticeship and Training Council. The content of this program is planned to be aligned with Tooling You, a manufacturing curriculum to produce future CNC operators. So what does that mean? So students coming out of Patapsico will have a certification or more importantly apprenticeship to be able to maintain and service um, food manufacturing equipment. So this is a good program and we hope to expand it in the future and we're looking for new business partners. Next up is PTEC, Pathways for Technology, Early College, High School. Anybody see PTEC commercial in the World Series or in Ravens game? So PTEC is advertising on television these days. Keep an eye out for it. So PTEC is going to be starting at Owings Mills High School next year. Um, as a reminder, PTEC is grades 9 through 14. It's a school within a school. The students get their high school diploma. They also get a two-year associate's degree um, in six years. It includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring, workplace visits, skills, instruction, paid internships in the summertime, workplace visits. Um, so it's start, starting again next year in Owings Mills. Already we have PTEC at Dundalk High. It's doing very well. There are 120 students there, 60 in ninth grade and, and 60 in 10th grade. And um, importantly, the, the companies that are supporting this at Owings Mills are Becton Dickinson, North American Millwright, Northrop Grumman, and F Potomac Photonics. And I'll save the rest for next month. Thank you for the opportunity. Great, thank you very much. Our next speaker for the evening is Tia Knott. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm here tonight to make a call to action. Um, from what has happened in Lutherville Lab just in the past two and a half months, the chaos, the fear of safety, and the lack of staffing from the implementation of a social emotional learning program, or CELL, I am here to call BCPS and the board to action. Countywide, the implementation and functionality of the CELL program is in need of a severe overhaul. I have spoken to stakeholders at other schools with the CELL program, and I encourage you all to speak with them as well, and speak with parents of cell children. The program needs to be fixed. We need a thorough review of current policies and more policies put in force for placement determination criteria for all IEPs prior to transferring students outside of their home school. We need oversight of staffing and supports. We need to reevaluate the ratio of students to support staff for all cell programs. We need oversight to include immediate coverage for any staffing shortages, no matter how temporary. I ask that BCPS have strict qualifications and checks and balances for all IEPs that determine the placement of a student. I ask the board to read clearly the intent of IDEA and Comar's education article. I ask you to review your budget for special education, inclusive of state and federal funding under IDEA, to really optimize the use of funds to properly determine students capable of success upon placement into a cell program, and to keep each program properly and fully staffed at all times. I think BCPS can do a better job at providing the least restrictive education to all children. I know technically LRE is only a legally protected right for children with disabilities, but I believe we all can agree that the goal of BCPS is for all students to have the least restrictive education. I, can, I can't tell you how many times our families have heard that violence or outbursts will just have to be tolerated because this or that cell student ha deserves a least restrictive education. Actually, a critical qualifier of LRE is to the maximum extent possible. We need to do a better job of determining the best environment for each child that we allow, that, we will, that will allow them to get an education in a surrounding that supports their emotional healing. I think it is pretty well known that not every child does well in a crowd or in a public setting. When an IEP team does not consider the emotional impact of a physical setting on a child, but rather focuses on the misconception that a program within a general education system is least restrictive, they are setting that child up for failure. In the meantime, oh, I'm sorry, I totally just lost my place. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> They're setting that child up for failure and potentially setting them back any emotional growth they may have had by putting them into a large general setting. In the meantime, the course between a child being overwhelmed from their setting and the child acting out, all children within the school can, can potentially be put into the crossfire. 
and I lost my place after that. I'm very sorry. I think I dropped my paper back at my chair, but I do thank Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Heather Autoria. Say, say that again. Otina. Otina. Okay. Well, welcome. Good evening to everybody. Um, I really appreciate your time. And um, I just want to take a few minutes to quickly kind of summarize and present some ideas and thoughts that I have as a Baltimore County um, parent of two. Um, as I said, I have, a, I have a kindergartner and a second grader in Baltimore County. And I come to you not just as a parent of Hampton Elementary, but as a parent of the school system. I personally work in Baltimore City Schools, so I have seen a lot of schools. I've seen lots of differences in all of the things. And um, yes, there is a, re a boundary study that has been on the table um, for Hampton, Halstead, and Pleasant Plains. And while I do understand overcrowding, the concern that that brings up, my concern with Baltimore County in general over the years, because I have lived through this with another school in the county, um, is what from the parent side seems like a short-sighted, short thought out, short-term, nearsighted, whatever adjectives you want to put, plan to alleviate a problem. <clears throat> Everything is a very pressing issue. We need new high schools, we need new this, new that, and it's impossible to kind of figure out a solution that solves everything. But I would just really, <clears throat> implore the board um, to work with families, schools, principals, stakeholders, everyone that they possibly can get their hands on to look for solutions to solve these overcrowding, these disproportionate groupings of students, period, um, <clears throat> and solve them in a way that actually makes a real solution for more than just one, two, or three schools. Um, it's terrifying to me that my kid <clears throat> as close as we live to school, does go on 695 in a bus in the afternoon at 4 o'clock um, with no seat belts, my kindergartner, you know, and they think it's fun, but it terrifies me. And to have a kid on a bus um, for longer times, coming from farther distances, past schools that could possibly house those kids in neighborhoods with kids from neighborhoods closer to them seems like a much more reasonable idea than shifting and shuffling and solving one quick solution. Um, again, I think it's short-sighted, and I think there's definitely a lot of very talented and educated and very in, in, insightful and creative people who might be able to come up with better solutions for this. That would be a long-term solution and be more impactful than just right now this little bitty situation. Um, I thank you for your time, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker for the evening is Mr. Glenn Gilhar. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, distinguished members of the Board of Education. Thank you all for your service. So earlier tonight you had uh, a visit from uh, Mama Bear Bergman. Tonight I, I present to you the Lorax. Um, my daughter made this, drew by freehand. My daughter Brittany, and uh, it's got the little don't sign and says cut down trees. And I guess I would add to that unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, earlier tonight, a uh, number of people commented about uh, overcrowding at schools like Pleasant Plains. And you know, one of the reasons that, that a lot of these schools around the Parkville area are overcrowded is because this um, board, not this board, but the Board of Education decided to close Lock Raven Elementary School, Parkville Elementary School. They did a big consolidation, and now we're paying, our children are paying the price. Um, a few years back, one of the previous uh, superintendents had a town hall meeting. Some of you were probably there. It was at Perry Hall High School. They had a follow-up meeting at uh, Lock Raven High School. And the superintendent said, you know, do you, the people in attendance, know of any county-owned properties that, you know, would be suitable for a new elementary school to bring relief? And me, as a graduate of Parkville Elementary School, which was on Hiss Avenue, I said, Hey, I know a spot. I said, right down the end of the same street is a property that was a private house, a private residence up till 1975 when the county bought it. It's next to a park. It was a private residence. And I said, well, hey, this was an over 20-acre property. Why not take a look at that? It would bring 
would have brought relief to Pleasant Plains, uh, would have been brought relief to a lot of the Parkville area because it would have replaced the old Parkville Elementary School. Um, more recently, I received some emails to this board that I was copied on and also to the county executive saying, hey, why not look at the old uh, Rosedale Elementary School? Uh, you have, um, it's been a temporary home, I think, to Colgate currently and to Victory Villa. So, you know, that building has proven to be a viable place for an elementary school. Um, so when your budget is approved, uh, or capital budget is approved, uh, there's a plan right now to build a new Northeast Elementary School at Ridge Road, Gum Spring, and Rossville Boulevard. And this is a 20-acre uh, wooded property. And don't get me wrong, we really do need a new Northeast School. But my question is, and this guy's question is, is, is this the best place for the school? Um, I mentioned his Avenue. It would have certainly brought a lot more relief over to places like Pleasant Plains. Um, you know, looking at Rosedale, maybe a combination of school product projects. But um, you know, my hope is is that perhaps you can take the pause button or hit the pause button and revisit the location for the school and just see, you know, is this really the best spot to give you the most relief for for the least amount of money? Okay, thanks. Thanks again for your service. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Nussbaum. Excuse me. Where did I? I'm sorry, there's one additional public speaking spot. At first reader, we have a uh, Citizens have the ability to provide public comment on proposed changes to policies. And for policy 3250, I call on Ms. Diana Bergman, who signed up earlier this evening. So policy um, 3250 um, is going to set, from my understanding, some guidelines to understand um, how we do the, the contracts. And the only thing that I wanted to see if it was considered that I have brought up in the past, and I'm not exactly sure if this is the policy that pertains to it, but when a contract goes out for bid for um, either a construction job for building new schools or a renovation job project, um, each company that's going for that bid, um, some of them could use certain grants that are available and I wanted the opportunity um, if somebody was bringing in a lower estimate of construction of the building to share that information, how that was possible because they possibly qualify for a grant. So that was something that I had mentioned in the past about not leaving any money on the table and sometimes um, companies that qualify for those grants for construction or renovation projects. Um, they could come in with the lower number to complete the job because they qualify. So I wanted that option to be available for them to disclose if a company does qualify. Um, and that's why they're bringing that lower number so they don't get bypassed on the construction project. So yeah, that was it. Thanks. Thank you. Now we are going to item J, new business action taken in closed session. And for that, we have Mr. Nussbaum. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. That matter was considered on the record because there was no request for an oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action that was taken by the board in closed session in that matter, which was summary affirmance, which was, um, excuse me, hearing examiner number 20-27. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And the order's on the table to be signed before you leave. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is a new business report. And we call on Mr. Kuhn from the Audit Committee to introduce the fiscal year. 
2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report and Single Audit. All right, hold on to your seats. This is gonna be some exciting stuff coming up. Mr. George Sarris, could you please come up and talk to us about this? Uh, just to give a little background, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is prepared annually in compliance with the public school laws of the state of Maryland. All funds and accounts of the board are included in this. While the board is an entity created and governed by state law, it has been defined as a component unit of the Baltimore County government for financial reporting purposes. The financial statements for fiscal year 2019 have been audited by Clifton Larson Allen LLP in accordance with state law. The independent auditor's report is included in the financial section of the CAFR. As required as a condition of receipt of federal funds, Clifton Larson Allen LLP also conducts an annual audit of federal funds. The fiscal year 2019 single audit of federal funds is also provided. This can be found <clears throat> on board docs under this section electronically, and I'm guessing at some point it'll be put online, just like 2018. It will immediately, as soon as possible after this meeting, yes. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. I would like to just add that um, on September 27th, uh, Clifton Larson Allen uh, issued their most favorable unmodified opinion uh, on our financial statements, uh, indicating that the statements fairly present in all material aspects the financial position of the board and that we have complied with all federal uh, requirements for our major grant programs. The uh, CAFR and single audit were then filed as required on September 30th with MSDE, with Baltimore County Government and the Department of Legislative Services. Um, and last month on October 15th, we met with the board's audit committee, uh, my staff and uh, director from Clifton Larson Allen to uh, discuss the statements and answer questions. And just wanted to also add that uh, the Office of Financial Reporting uh, in the Department of Fiscal Services has been awarded, uh, has been recognized by both Government Finance Officers Association and Association of School Business Officials for uh, putting together the document and um, receiving and being awarded and recognized for that effort and um, simply ask that the board accept these reports tonight. Yes. Are there any sections or areas of the report that you would wanna you know, focus our attention on or you know, share to call out besides the fact that you guys did such a fine job that you got an award for it? Well, I think, uh, What's, uh, maybe I'll call attention to what is not here, which are any management comments uh, that were, when, when the auditors find areas of deficiency, they would uh, bring those to, to the superintendent's attention and we would take uh, corrective actions. And in this case, this year, there are no such comments. So we're very uh, proud of that. But other than that, I don't, uh, if, there's, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Board members? Well, hearing no questions, I'll just highlight a few pages from earlier this evening. We talked about our amazing student artwork, and we have one example here from our Cedarmere Elementary School. So even those of you who don't wanna pour over this as we do, you can go online and look at the student artwork. And the last one I'll leave you with is this one. I think one. that's page 41. Page 41, wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. So thank you very much, Mr. Saris. Thank you all very much. Good evening. The next item on the agenda is item L, board committee updates. And the board chair will go around the room seeking comments from committee chairs. And I started on that side. So I can start on this side. Uh, Mr. Offerman? Or I'm sorry, I'll take that one. Mr. Kuhn? 
So for the last audit committee meeting, I was absent, so I will defer to Ms. Causey, who's the vice chair, and I believe we're in the meeting. Thank you. We had a great meeting. They presented the CAFR to us as, long as, as well as giving updates on their work plan, and we look forward to the next meeting coming up in December. Thank you. Ms. Pasture for Legislative and Government Relations Committee. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Baysmore and I uh, attended the um, May legislative meeting. A lot was discussed from Kerwin to the um, building um, funding committee to the uh, build to learn, just uh, pointing out that uh, when the uh, session begins, House and Senate bills number one for both will be um, the bill to learn um, uh, bills. Okay, that, that was redundant. But that's good news that um, both the Senate and the um, legislature will be taking a look at that. That is real good news. So we're very hopeful with that. Also know that on February the 13th, uh, we will have a Legislature Day in Annapolis, and so I encourage board members and TABCO members and, and parents and friends and everyone to come to Annapolis and Sharon and, and uh, Diana come to Annapolis and meet with our elected officials and talk about what we need. And Dr. McComas, come too. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Hen for buildings and contracts. There are no updates for buildings and contracts. Thank you. In Policy Review Committee, we met November 11th. Um, and we discussed um, several policies, including policy 5110, admissions, policy 8120, purpose, role, and responsibilities of the Board of Education. We also uh, discussed policy 2310, organization charts, and policy 4009, emergency closings, employee attendance. Um, all of our committee meetings are available online under the Board of Education Leadership tab. Um, th so you can find out when the next meetings are. You can also go there and see the agenda for the upcoming meetings. And you can also uh, there find the minutes for the meeting, both an ed educational summary, educational transparency summary, as well as the full video. And that's my report. Thank you. Ms. Mack for curriculum. Yes, thank you. Um, for almost a year now, Dr. McComas and her team have been bringing um, topics to the curriculum committee that helped the curriculum committee board members um, have a better understanding of policies and procedures that affect our students and different curriculum offerings, and we appreciate that. Um, most recently, board members made specific requests of Dr. McComas's team, and as a result, during this week's curriculum committee meeting, um, staff will provide an overview of BCPS's social emotional learning programs to the committee members. In January, staff will provide an overview of magnet programs, and then in February, Dr. McComas's staff will speak to BCPS's use of bridge projects to meet graduation requirements, and we appreciate um, taking those topics on. Thank you, and that concludes our committee reports. The next item is item M, information. And uh, on board docs is a number of pieces of information, including revised superintendent's rule 6301 instruction, schools and school calendar, revised superintendent's rule 6702 instruction, extracurricular activities, intramural, interscholastic, and corollary athletic programs. Also, revised Superintendent's Rule 7530, new construction, uh, naming or renaming area of a school or its grounds. Additionally, there are financial reports for the months ending September 2018 and 2019. We also have our Central Area Advisory Council Minutes, Northwest Area Education Advisory Council Minutes, and Southeast Area Education Advisory Council Minutes um, for 
October and also Southwest Area Education Advisory Council minutes of October are all in board docs. The next item is announcements. Uh, the next board meeting is going to be Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019, right here at 630. And with that, our meeting is complete. We wish everyone a happy and healthy and safe Thanksgiving. The meeting is adjourned.